Wow, that's 8.30. From Microbe TV, this is Q&A with A and V. I am Vincent Racaniello. And joining me tonight in her complimentary color, Amy Rosenfeld. <laughs> My complimentary color. It's tangerine. Hello, I'm Vincent. Red. How are you today? I'm oh, well, thank tangerine. you very much. All right. Can I do my big unveil? Yes. Amy had a visitor this week and she wants I know, to know. I met Jen, Animal Party. It was super exciting. And then look at what she brought me. My beautiful painting. Look. It's beautiful. Let me give you full screen treatment right, here. Wait a minute. Can I do that? Yeah. Well, I, I'm afraid I won't be able to get back. All right. But look. Isn't it gorgeous? Can't yeah. wait to hang it. It's green and purple. It's green and purple with amethyst crystals in it. And then it has like amethyst iridescent uh, outline and in ink. It's super cool. Yes, an animal party is here tonight so she can see you. Yeah. And let me show you. So this animal party yeah, visited. The pictures of animal party. Animal party visited this week. And so here is she is with her painting and... Um, with is that Amy? That's me. The gray sweater. Here's Animal Party. Okay, so uh, <laughs> that's very cool. I like that painting very much. And then we have another uh, Animal Party. Try to hide got, your jealousy. <laughs> she got her picture taken in front of the wall of polio, uh, which is back there. So this is very cool. Um, yeah, it's, it's super cool. cool. So this if you want to, you can visit the incubator, but, you know, Jen made the, the schlep uptown and visited Columbia. So um, she got to see the wall of polio and uh, Amy. So cool. Yeah. It was and, great visit. Uh, someday Super that will cool. hang in Amy's own space, right? Yep. It's going on the wall in my office when Isn't I get an office. Isn't that a great painting? It's a, it's a beautiful painting. It's a, it's an enterovirus, yeah. right, Amy? Entero 68? It's EVD 68. And, um, yeah, super you, cool. you picked the colors. Okay, one more thing before we. Yeah, we picked the colors together. It was a, it was a collaboration. Um, that's great. And it was a surprise to me. Okay, yep. so that's good. The other thing I wanted to ask folks is tonight, Instead of giving to the incubator, I'd like you to give to support Amy's research. She's in, as we've talked about the last few weeks, uh, uh, times are tough for uh, research funds for Amy. And her project is brilliant. And so um, I'd like you to support it. It's up to you, of course. But instead of supporting Microbe TV and the incubator tonight, uh, I would like you go to go to this page, givenow.columbia.edu, okay, givenow.columbia.edu. And I'm going to show you the page and show you what to do. So you go to givenowcolumbia.edu, okay, and you, you'll end up at the top there. And then you scroll down, and it says Search Columbia Funds, and, and then you put in Enterovirus. I don't know if you can still see that. It's all the way at the top. There it is, Enterovirus D Research Fund. So you click on that, and so now it's selected, right? And then you click your amount, and, or you can put in another amount, uh, and then you uh, click Add the Gift, and it will bring you to your credit card information. And this goes directly to Columbia for Amy's research, the Enterovirus D68 Research Fund. Okay, folks, so tonight, give your money that you would normally give to Microbe TV and the incubator. Give it to uh, to Amy's work. I think it's uh, highly meritorious, as we say. Givenow.columbia.edu. I'll just leave it up there for a while. And then you, you scroll down, you'll see the search box. Type in Enterovirus, and it'll pop up Enterovirus D68, okay? Good luck. Amy. <laughs> okay, well, we let's need more see. than one night, but yeah. No, we'll do uh, multiple nights. Yes, for yeah. sure. Well, we should. I won't. Well, we're going to move next week till Thursday night because Wednesday night I'm traveling. That's right. We're going to switch to Thursday next week because Amy is traveling next week. 
um, in connection with perhaps a new position, right? Maybe. I think yes. The answer is yes, but and it's good to be. Um, it's good to be um, cautious. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I'm um, not taking it for granted. Do you know? Anyway, I want to th thank the moderators before we start. So we have tonight: Steph, Les, Tom, Vanity Nutrition, and um, I haven't seen Frank yet. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate it. Thank you to everyone who's here. Look at this, 400 people. It's awesome. And uh, it's great. we're going to answer some they of your questions. They all came to see my painting and Jen. Yes, of course. Absolutely. No they didn't come to see you. No. Do you want me to go? I can go. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, and I don't know. Any thoughts on Biden's comments on COVID test and treat program? So he said that he's going to give out free tests and then he wants anybody who's positive to be immediately be given antivirals right after they test positive. Sounds good to me. And everybody everyone, needs congressional. Not, yeah. Not everyone, everyone who tests positive. Everyone Why would who you tests do that? positive. Why would you do because, that? Because these tests are indiscriminate, right? No, but what if you're triple vaccinated and you have no symptoms? Why would you need an antiviral? Why would you be testing? I think if you are at risk for severe disease, then you should do this. But to be using antivirals at that level is not a good idea, in my opinion. But I would be interested to see what Daniel has to say about it tomorrow. Yeah, I'm, right? I'm sure he'll be. I'm sure he's for it. Test everyone? Because this whole thing is that you need to treat early. Well, if you're at risk, right? But who knows if you're at no, risk? No, even, even if you're not at risk, right? Yeah, well, the, the original idea for the antivirus was to give it to people at risk, not just everyone. I'm not sure what that accomplishes, but so be well, it. Well, why do you need to give, why, why are you segregating out only people at risk? Because That's the idea is, is if you give antivirals, you, squ you squash the infection so that theoretically they don't transmit to the next person, right? How much transmission is there anyway in a vaccinated person? Who knows? You want to do right. the study? Yeah, I would like to. I yeah, would. well, it, you know, there have been some, you know, there have not been good studies on it. The theory is, is that they transmit as efficiently or just slightly under whether or not that's right or wrong. That's what the CDC thinks. No, right. I, I disagree. Anyway, that's fine. Uh, Costello says, uh, how scared of hantavirus should I be? Mice moved in when the company shut the power off for eight days. I've been at war with them. Uh, the hantavirus infections in the U S are quite rare. So I wouldn't sweat over it. Just if there are mouse droppings, don't, Spray them with a little bleach to wet them before you, you clean them up. Because if you clean them up dry, you're going to aerosolize them, and that's the um, the risk, okay? So just be careful with the feces. And yes, Lauren, if I leave, the money does come with me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she asked, if Amy leaves, does the money we give tonight go with her? And yes, it goes with me. Yeah, she'll get the money. No worries about that. Okay. I'm not going to get in an argument with that person. Really? You're having an argument already? And it's not me? <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't know an answer to this one. My son committed to PhD program in chemistry at Princeton. Any advice? I don't know any chemistry labs. I do have people I know at Princeton who could tell me who, which is a good chemistry lab if you'd like to do that. You don't know any chemistry at Princeton, do you, uh, Amy? I think Ileana is part of the chemistry department. You think so? Ileana Krista. Yeah, I think her. she's part of the chemistry department. If she is, that, she would be great. She would be great to work with. And what's the color of your sweater? It's tangerine. Tangerine. Everyone's very excited to be here. This is great. 
I'm so excited. I can't contain my excitement. And then people are it's great. Are telling us what they're drinking and eating. Dark chocolate. Really? Really? Hoping Avoid for a master Princeton, of reality says. classic combo of black sweater and purple shirt. I don't think so. Who's the master of reality? I don't know. This is you. This is when you dress with black sweater and purple shirt. But not tonight. No, not tonight. Is it just me or is Greg Gonsalves losing his mind saying the best way we will be prepared for the next surge is by never lifting mask mandates and sterilizing vaccines? Yeah, uh, that's not saying reasonable things. Who is he? I don't know, but th what he said here, uh, the uh, sterilizing vaccines are not happening. They're not happening well, for this virus. There are very few sterilizing, if any, sterilizing vaccines. And for this virus and that I'm undergoes antigenic variation, it's not happening. So I think that's a silly statement, and we need to lift mask mandates because we have vaccines that work and prevent severe disease. Time to move on. What's the situation in New York, Amy? Uh, masks uh, have been removed, so you don't have to wear you don't have to wear a mask in public indoor public spots. And on Monday, the mask mandate in school gets lifted. This uh, reflects a lack of understanding of basic virology, Zachary. But, but I what don't else think is the guy's there? a virologist, is he? Then he should stay in his lane, don't you think? Doesn't well, even know I'm always sterilizing... advocating people to stay in their lane because when they swerve into my lane, they get they cause accidents. And you know, next time we're gonna have a what you know when you get on the parkway and they say that there's like that sixteen truck pileup. What's the name for that thing? You know, know they. Yeah, I there's know. a fancy but, but, name for like the big accidents that like pile up like that's a, like a chain reaction but i'm blanking on it all right brendan says what would you do if you had a bsl4 lab in a war zone are there any four labs in eastern europe russia ukraine how will sanctions on russia affect science research other than space oh it's atrocious right now what's science atrocious sanctions, sanctions on science research in russia is like bankrupting it like there's articles on the front page of nature there's a website about the scientists in the ukraine and and the disaster that they're undergoing it's a travesty hmm. and yes there are bsl4 laboratories in eastern europe and i believe there's one at the moscow institute of virology so there's one in belarus uh, there is there are a bunch in France, Gabon, Germany, Hungary, India, Italy. Yeah, but that's Italy. not. But me. you have to. Yeah, that's there are not. There BSL-4s. I'm looking at the list. Russia has two. I know, two. but that's not Eastern Europe. That's Western Europe. I'm just Europe. going through all of it. Russia has two. Yeah. Um, the UK has many. The US has a bunch. But none in the Ukraine. So it could comfort. they should shut them down. But it's very hard to shut them down. It's a long process. Uh, have you read the paper? Highly divergent white-tailed deer SARS-CoV-2 with potential deer to human transmission. Yes. I think the word potential is misplaced here because we have no idea. There's no evidence that it has gone back from deer to humans, right, Amy? Uh, I don't think the evidence is... Uh, as solid as it should be but the hypothesis is, is even if it did it does not in the alterations that it acquires while uh replicating or reproducing in deer do not enhance pathogenicity in humans did you see the ferret mink paper we did the the, the data adaptation the one amino acid adaptation to to uh, ferrets mink I sent actually it. makes it less fit for human cells Yes, yes, I know you sent it. I know you sent so, it. When, yes, you, when I you leave, are you gonna, when you leave, are you going to stop sending me papers? No. Why would I stop sending papers? I haven't. I'm not leaving. Who knows if I'm actually going to leave? It's a pipe dream at this point. Don't jinx it. Should the definition of serotype be changed? No. Or sh should it be thrown out as an old definition entirely? 
Now you should just learn the appropriate definition and how to apply it. Do you throw out words that you, that and change definitions of words because you don't know how to define them properly or they're not used properly? Well, what's your de what's your definition of serotype? Uh, uh, my definition of serotype is polyclonal sera, which has significant reduction, greater than 80% protection in an animal model of disease. Really? It's in animals? Has to be in animals. So, Just like they did for polio. Has to be you, in animals. You, but, but Amy, it depends on how often you immunize the animals because we learned with Omicron, no, the third no, dose will neutralize no, where the second not, dose did that's not. not. That's Can not how it's done. Can you let me finish, done. Amy? Let me finish. Third dose of Omicron, second dose does not neutralize Omicron, third dose does. So how does that make that's it a not how it's, that's not That's not, that's vaccination. That has nothing to do with serotype. Well, the those guys serotype were calling is, it serotype. No, the way, no, the way serotype you is You need to defined. calm down for where you're going. You need to calm down for where you're going. Well, you need to like <laughs> listen and to process and get it right. Because I'm just the, repeating it, what the authors said. They said that it's neutralization right, it's not. in cell culture. No. It's not. It's okay. in animals. It's defined in animals. And that's, it's not a neutralization assay. And it has nothing to do with vaccination. The way serotype is defined is you take an animal and you immunize it with one virus. And then you wait three weeks and you challenge it with, in, with another virus and ask, does that animal now develop severe disease? That's what they did for polio. That's what they did for rhino in, in volunteers. It is not about vaccination or anything. It is about whether or not when you take an when you take an isolate and you immunize an animal. With what? And then with what? you immunize challenge with what? So, so you like for polio, they immunized with a untyped virus. And then they challenged that animal with what they called ser what they called Mahoney. And if that animal developed paralysis, it was not protected. It was a different serotype. If the animal did not did develop they, how, how many times did they immunize these animals? Just once. So that's what your definition is, once? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Just once. Okay. I'm not sure that that is appropriate yes because you're yeah it's absolutely appropriate because you're asking whether or not a vaccine you're not asking whether i don't care about vaccines serotype is not defined by vaccination it's defined by natural immunity okay so that's fair enough but what if you got infected three times and then it's no longer a serotype what do you do what do you mean if you get infected three times I don't understand the point. What's your? What are you trying to say? So you, you get infected with a virus, and then you are now, when you're reinfected, you're resistant. So that's the same serotype. You don't get disease. But then you're you're infected with another serotype, and you get disease. But what if you had? You been... get severe disease. Yeah. Okay. You get paralysis. It's not that you got a fever. It's that you develop paralysis. The animal developed paralysis. This is going to be different for every virus, though, because obviously they don't cause all cause the same. Right, disease, but they all right? but some will cause severe disease, right? Yeah. Okay. So if you get if you get infected with SARS-CoV-2, and you resolve the infection, and then five years later you get infected with SARS-CoV-2, and now you develop ARDS, that most likely is probably a different serotype. If you got infected with SARS-CoV-2. And, and five years later, you got infected with SARS-CoV-2 and all you get is a mild cold. It's not as severe. It's not. It's it, it most likely is not a different serotype. Most likely it's a reflection of contraction of the immune response. Yeah, well, I think we should throw it out. I don't think it's of value anymore because we don't do those experiments that you would like us to do. We can't do them. We're not going to do them. So it's of no value. Okay. What are the reasons for the lower efficacy of the whole virus vaccine compared with mRNA vaccines? What do you think, Amy? Well, sometimes if you have a whole virus, it also has 
innate and it has an immune antagonist in it. And also maybe it's the wrong antigenic form, like a D versus a C antigen, right, Amy? Right, right. So for polio vaccines, when you produce them, you can have the wrong antigenic form and uh, that's not good. So unless you pay attention to that, which I doubt they did for SARS-CoV-2, that could explain it. Whereas the mRNA, don't have to worry. It's just making a protein at rather high level. Well, if you have so much, you overcome whether or not the antibodies are high affinity because now you have low affinity but high affinity, right? Because you have yeah. more, right? Yep. Amy, do you have a favorite band? Do I have a favorite band? I don't know that I have a favorite band. I definitely like some bands. Really? Uh, some. I think yeah. you like Prince, don't you? I like Prince, but I like Yaz, and I like the Arrhythmics, and I like Annie Lennox, and I like, uh, whatchamacallit, um, Joy Division and various other things, yeah. Cool. Will you be doing Do you have live? a favorite band? No, a favorite band I would have to listen to often. I don't listen to music often to have a favorite. There are bands that I like very much. I like the band. I like the Beatles. I like Led Zeppelin. I like Pink Floyd. Um, but I also like the Allman Brothers band. <laughs> I have an eclectic taste. But I wouldn't say none of them, any of them is my favorite because I really don't listen much. Will you be doing live streams on other subjects besides COVID? Yeah. I mean, Hopefully. the idea would, would be that this live stream would evolve into a general virology, right, Amy? Yeah, for sure. So hopefully, and I don't, I don't know when, but, you know, as people ask questions about other viruses, we'll, we'll judge when we change the title of it to virology live stream, as answering your virus questions. Thank you, Rob, for your contribution. Elevate yeah. the incubator. Appreciate it. And an animal party says you are more lovely and brilliant in person. That's so nice. She's lovely. She sent me an email this morning. I just have been really busy. I have to respond. Would you have your kids continue to mask in school if cases in LA County are over 50 per 100,000? My kids will unmask in a week with high transmission because districts are giving the option. Well, you if think? you're if there's an option, why are your kids unmasking then? What if they're vaccinated? That's fine. They can be unmasked. I mean, the truth of the matter is is you really want cases to be one under one per a hundred thousand. It also depends on where the 50 per 100,000 are in relationship to where you are. LA County is a yeah, very large yeah. place. That's a good point. I don't know. I, I would take that into consideration, but I would favor if they're vaccinated, no masking. Zachary wants to know why have so many in the field lost the plot and convinced themselves the only way to, the pandemic ends is if all transmission is stopped. I don't know. This is one of the, as Amy will tell you, one of the many things that have gone wrong in the field during well, this I pandemic. Well, I think that, I think that one of the problems is, is that the people who had the loudest voice at the beginning were not virologists. And one person in particular from Yale had a very loud voice because she fits into a group, a category that, and stuff that people now overcompensate for and she is not really a virologist and at best an iffy immunologist <laughs> so this is why i don't approve of the biden antiviral because you're not going to stop transmission you're not going to get enough antivirals to people to do that well i don't uh, and you're going to select for resistance i'm sorry you you're are. always going to select for resistance but when you give people antibiotics you're selecting for resistance and if you just have a, even if you have the, before you have a full-blown earache, they give you antibiotics. 
So are we trying to make antivirals the, uh, and the equivalent to antibiotics for viruses? Mm, yeah. Crisis. We're going to make an antiviral crisis. Right. Sounds good. Matt wants to know, regarding B-cell boot camp, what are the leading theories about the fitness test that influences further somatic hypermutation? Right. I understand. My understanding is it's a, it's an antibody affinity for the epitope, right, Amy? That's my understanding. Yeah, that the uh, higher affinity in, uh, antibodies will move to the next step. <laughs> Amy has an artistic eye. Yes, Amy's responsible for the colors at the incubator. One guy yeah, wrote today that he he didn't like the the virus like panels behind me and Daniel that one time. He didn't like it. Who wrote this? Some listener. He said he didn't like it. Can't please everyone, Amy. Did you know? Well, so first of all, the company makes sound panels in specific fashions, right? Yeah. So you have to buy what's available. And you want and we wanted something different than the big placard sound panels for an interview area, right? Yeah, I thought it was cool that they were virus like. Yeah, I don't understand. Well he did yeah, like the others. He did like the other panels, Amy. So So the large placard panels he likes? Yeah. The red, green, and gray. Okay. But they don't show up in the video very much, right? Right, but, okay. What did you think of the pediatric vaccine preprint that came out in New York, of New York, just in time for unmasking in schools? So I, I haven't read it, but it seems now that there's conflicting, there's conflicting evidence. So some people say the waning, it wanes significantly, and other people say it doesn't wane as much or there is no waning so i don't know i haven't read it you think they released children, it just in time for the unmasking no the cdc released i think the pfizer it was a time point in the pfizer study where they yeah. because the question is is what are they going to do about the under five right which was pulled back and it seems to be problematic. So then they went to see what they should do. And then they looked at the five to 12 year olds. If two viruses infect one cell, which virus wins? I don't know that there's a, what, are they two different viruses or are they the same virus? Hey, that's a good question. <laughs> it's the same virus. They probably both contribute, right? Right. I mean, and is there a recombinant event? Could be. So, or if I don't it's know. two viruses, it depends on the viruses and the timing. I mean, if yeah. polio infects, it will wipe out everything else because it's fast and it shuts down the host. So it would outcompete adenovirus, which takes a long time to reproduce. Yeah, but if it if it's polio and... C99, I'm not sure it outcompetes. Yeah, maybe not C99. I don't know. Those rhinos cannot compete with polio, though, in my opinion. It's a rhino. It's an entero. Entero C99? Yeah, it's in the same Why family. do you think it's more fit than polio? I don't know. I didn't say it was. It's an up and coming, it's, a right. re it's an emerging entero that is right. a recombinant. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Um, have you seen this paper, intracellular reverse transcription of Pfizer-BioNTech mRNA vaccine in vitro in a human liver cell line? Yes, it's irrelevant. It means nothing. You know, our, our cells are full of mRNA. Did you know that? And it gets reverse transcribed occasionally, and sometimes it's integrated, but it doesn't have any consequence. And so this is no different. So I just think this is a waste of bits, digital bits. What do you think of this paper, Amy? 
Uh, I think that the whole idea is ludicrous and it is just a bunch of people who don't understand biology who are trying to be sensationalists and trying to jump on the bandwagon to, I don't know, in, enhance their reputation either on social media or potentially try and get a grant. And if I were the grant reviewer, I would send it back unscored. I would too. By the way, uh, if some of you may have noticed, the preprint has come out saying the Huanan marketplace was the epicenter of the early outbreak. And one of the authors on that is Michael Warroby, and he has confirmed an appearance on TWIV soon. It's great. I think that's very Are you going to have him solely or are you going to have him with uh, Robert Gary? I'll ask him if he'd like to have a, um, a support. Yeah. Because Gary's on the paper, and so is Anderson, right? Yeah, it might be interesting to have all three. Or even, yeah. like, even if you got, even though Dasak's not on the paper, it might be interesting to have his opinion, too. Uh, is there an advantage to forming syncytia versus cell-to-cell -cell movement? Probably, yes. You avoid being targeted by the antibody response. Yeah. Yes, you can move intracellularly head in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are we in the last stretch of SARS-2? In this country or in what, the world? Mm, both. Let, answer both. No. In this country, both? No? In the world? We're not in the last stretch? No. Okay. Which means we're going to have another wave? Yes. Okay, there you go, Ian. I hope you got what you wanted. <laughs> Amy, do you have a favorite breakfast? I don't like breakfast. If I had, if I could eat this often, I don't. It would be a sesame bagel with butter and dark roast coffee. But I can't. Probably even more than the almond croissant. Uh, it's a, uh, yeah, I, the almond croissant is fabulous. There's a nice bakery in New York called the Le Pain Quotidien, the Daily Bread. They make stuff every day, and they make great almond croissants. But no bagel. I love a sesame bagel, and if you salted toast it, butter. Oh, salted butter is the best. Yes, yeah, salted butter is the best. But with coffee, with a good dark roast coffee, the two of the pairing is wonderful. Nothing else. I don't need anything else. I don't need no eggs. I don't need bacon. I don't need any of that stuff. Just a bagel. And you know what, folks? Okay. On the ground floor, right under the incubator, they're opening a new bagel store, and they're going to make the bagels there. So let's. I'm going to get some for Amy, and she'll tell me if they're any good. That is true. <laughs> that is true. My great uncle was a bagel baker, so yes, I'm. I'm very opinionated on bagels. However, uh what was I going to say? Egg and bacon on a bagel? You can't no, put no. bacon on a bagel. You can't. It's, it's you, you just can't put bacon and ham on a bagel. Sacrilegious. Just does not go. If you want an egg sandwich, you put it on an English muffin. Yeah, toasted sesame bagel with butter. There you go. I, but if, I like it if you get the bagel warm from the shop. You don't have to toast it. And you put the butter on it and it melts. That's the best. So actually, when I grew up and you went to the bagel store and you yes. got a bagel, they refused to toast it. They would not toast it. I, I saw many a customer trying to convince the people behind the counter to toast the bagel. And they were like, no, we do not toast. No toast of bagel. And that, they are correct. No toast of bagel. Ah, the good old days. Amy, do you know anything about the Deep VZN program and publicly sharing genomes of viruses with potential zoonotic spillover? I don't know. What's, what is Deep VZN? Do you know? I don't know. Let's look it up. Deep. But v I think that anything that shares the genomes of deadly viruses mm. to understand is good. Oh, it's a new uh, government project. The deep viral zoonoses. That's what Deep VZN Five-year, $125 million project to detect and understand risks of spillover. 
pending availability of funds. What a crock. Come on, people. What do you announce a program if you don't have the money to support it? Oh, my God. I'm so tired of this government crap. I don't know. Uh, Amy, were the results good when you left live last week? You were pretty excited. Oh, you've had good results for weeks now, right? Look at those eyes. I think that those were the results I sent to Chumakov. So, yeah, I think that that was the result I was waiting for to talk to Chumakov. And, yeah, I'm, like, super excited about it. When will you publish and it? What? When will you When will you publish it? Oh, not until this summer. I don't think we'll be ready to publish it until the summer. But it'll be paper number two for the year. Should be big. I'm pretty, I'm pretty excited. If spike vax is too myopic, have you seen any papers on inactivated vaccines that look at efficacy, SAR, and trends like the Danish mRNA work, perhaps in Asia where their use was prevalent? Inactivated vaccines. I think that there's less data, way, way, way less data on them. But they're not reaching the 90s in efficacy against severe disease, right? I'm, I don't know. Since they weren't really used here and they were used in other areas that don't monitor and and stuff, I don't I don't know. I don't know that you those studies were done in the equivalent fashion so you could make any you could make um a comparison, a fair comparison. Yeah. But I think that the triple protein adenovector vaccine which you sent me and we did on twiv spike i think that's nuclear, pretty cool nuclear capsid rna polymerase oh that looked great that looked really cool i'm very excited about that yeah but as you said where are you going to test it how are you going to run a clinical trial getting harder and harder isn't it apparently Leonardi has tweeted about T-cell depletion in SARS-CoV-2 infections. Any comment? Who, the, who is Leonardi? I is don't like, care, like, but uh, the depletion, I think, is not a thing. I think it's rare, and now and then you see it, but I don't think it's a general feature of SARS-CoV-2 infections. It can't be. Otherwise, Alexander Sati would have already, like... yeah. He, he'd be out of business. No. How long am I immune from COVID since I caught late January? One year. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know. Are you sure you got COVID or did you test positive? We don't know. It's hard to say. One recovery, I would not be able to. If you got one vaccine dose, though, you'd be really good. Right, Amy? Yeah. If the virology genie granted the answers to three questions, what would be your questions? <sighs> Could be any virus, Amy. Any virus? Yeah, yeah, it doesn't have to be COVID. It's a virology genie, it's uh, non denominational. Well, I want to know how. Uh, virus, I want to know how viruses are stealth when they, uh, how a stealth virus enters the CNS. And I'd like to know how they, uh, decide how to be, you know, whether or not they should be transmitted by aerosol droplets or fomites or in the stool or whatever. Okay. Those are your questions? Those are two of them. And maybe why, yeah. I would like to know why for some viruses, some, well, let's say for polio, why 99% are mildly symptomatic or asymptomatic and 1% and is not? I'd like to know the answer to that. But I don't like know. To... Is the is the virology genie asking about the? Is he only going to solve the virus component of that? Because that's most likely a host component. I think the virology genie is a woman, first of all, 
and she <sighs> is going to solve anything we want because we are the okay. virologists. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, and I want to know why one and one and a half million kids develop vaccine associated polio. And I want to know the origin of all the variants, where they came from. Actually, I'd like to know the origin of SARS-CoV-2, which bat and which cave it came from and how. But it's oh, not a single me, bat. And now I would like to know the origin of polio virus. Where did that come from thousands of years ago? Which animal and how did it get into people? I don't know. But it's so interesting that 68 and 71 were first identified in California because I'm sure that they would, did not come from California. Someone wants you to have the nuclear destruct key. I don't want the nuclear self-destruct key. What do I need the nuclear self-destruct key? What's the medical criteria for antiviral use? Well, it depends on the virus, right? Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are two kinds of viruses in broad terms are ones that are rep reproducing really quickly and then ones that take forever, like hep C and HIV and so forth. So uh, for HIV and hep C, we know that there's a good probability that you're going to get very sick unless you take antiviral. So that's the criteria. If you're HCV positive or HIV positive, you get antivirals. I don't know that you want to define it as whether or not it replicates quickly because HIV replicates quickly to high titer. What it just I mean has a latency. It, it lasts it has, your lifetime. It lasts your lifetime. So it's chronic. It's a chronic it's infection. Acute. An acute infection has a beginning and an end. That's right. And so that's uh, for those chronic infections where we know there's going to be damage, you get you get antivirals. For, for flu, you can get a flu antiviral, right? If you test positive in the winter, you could get Tamiflu. No problem. The doc will write you a script. I wouldn't get, I wouldn't take an antiviral. I feel I'm not at high risk for severe disease, but that's not everyone's decision to make. Would you take Tamiflu, uh, Amy, if you got a positive flu test? No. Yeah. Well, I, I also do don't know, like one, one time point doesn't make a line. So when I get tested, I wouldn't know if I were at the beginning or at the end. And if I'm definitely at the end, then there's like tomorrow, there'll be no virus. So taking Tamiflu would be a waste. So, so Star Climber says you can suddenly discover you're at risk by developing severe illness. That's correct. However, well, the, that's data not say, a good plan. the data say that you are well protected against severe disease with three doses of vaccine. Okay. So why do I want to take an antiviral if I'm exposed? It makes zero sense to me. But I'm going with the vaccine, not the antiviral. Now, if you're not vaccinated or you're immunocompromised or you are you have many comorbidities or you're over 80 years old, yeah, you could take an antiviral. But I think those are special cases. Well, a lot of, yeah. All right, it's 913, so a few more and then I have to go. Are an antiviral is intended to fight off while the immune system spins up? I think for, for short infections like COVID and flu, no, they're meant to, to knock down the virus load so that you don't develop disease. There may be a contribution of the immune system in helping, but I'm not sure that that's the case with a short infection. Do you, Amy? I don't, I'm not sure. I would guess not. Reverend Sasquatch says, West Virginia Health Secretary said today, we finally have a sufficient supply of antivirals. Are you still concerned they will stop working or do we have enough treatments? I don't know. Damien and I differ. I think that we're going to get resistance. You don't, right? I didn't say I didn't think that we were going to get resistance. I think it depends on what you're giving, how fast the resistance is going to occur. Yeah. I think it's going to be a lot harder to get resistance against the one that is not really the direct target. It's a metabolite. That is the antiviral, right? Yeah. I'm not at risk, but I would love not to miss a ton of work days and get long COVID. Oh, if you're vaccinated, the likelihood of, do, of any of that is very low, right? It's not zero, but it's very low. 
Omicron is BA2 is 100% in Hong Kong, 96% in Denmark. You think that explained their current exponential COVID death rate? Well, that's the virus that's infecting them. So, yes, and they're probably mostly unvaccinated people. Would you say, Amy? So I don't know that I, I that because it those variants are circulating that I would ex- say that it explains their current exponential COVID death rate. Because I think any variant that was circulating at this time in those two places would have the exact same death rate. I yeah. feel it has to do with the way that they managed the pandemic to begin with. So like Hong Kong had like a complete zero tolerance policy, which was unreasonable. And so, and a lot of older people are refusing to get vaccinated. So I think that the way that they managed the geo, the political management of the epidemic has led, a pandemic has led to this uh, consequence. Because I think any variant would have given them the exact same. Yeah, I agree with that. I totally agree. There are different treatment options. There's more than one antiviral. What about monoclonals? All right, so Daniel has gone through for the last few weeks the prioritization of these, which you would do first, second, third, and fourth. Okay, monoclonals is in the mix along with Paxlovid. Molnupiravir and remdesivir are at the bottom of the list. Paxlovid, monoclonals, remdesivir, molnupiravir, in his estimation, would be the last one you would try. That's because it doesn't really work. (laughs) But why focus on the details? We don't always know who's at risk, so ID says treat. Well, it's not that simple, okay? It depends if you're not symptomatic, you're not going to get tested most likely. So that takes that out of the equation. You're not going to get tested, you're not going to get antivirals. If you get symptomatic and you're at risk, they will give you antivirals. But I'm not, and it, sure, if you're symptomatic and you're 25, you could, your doc may give you antivirals, sure. Um, but you have to be careful when you only have a few available because you're going to get resistance. Well, that's why you need combination. Combinations would be great. Then you get around, for the most part, resistance, yeah. What are your thoughts on scientists in South Africa reverse engineering Moderna's COVID vaccine as Moderna won't share its process? What does reverse engineering mean? Well, they don't know the composition of the lipid nanoparticle, right? So they're analyzing it. They're probably doing mass spec and figuring out how to make it. On lipids, you do mass spec or HPLC? HPLC, whatever. But don't you think you could then get the composition and figure out how to make it? Yeah, I guess. I'm not a lipid Uh, chemist. But anyway, what what are your thoughts on that? I mean... What do you think I think about it really that? sucks that Moderna didn't share the process. I think that in a time of a pandemic, you're going to make a lot of money off of this technology because now everybody thinks it's the guru technology. So they're going to make a vaccine against cancer and a variety of other things irrelevant. The fact that it's really, it's just an administrative tool. It really has to do with the antigen, right? Yeah. So, and so I don't really think that they're going broke. Yeah, I, th- I agree. I think it's really crappy that they're not sharing. They're making a ton of money already. Um, not a good thing. Uh, Amy, the guy replacing Rush Limbaugh said on the radio, there's zero proof of benefit of vaccine to 5 to 11-year-olds. What the heck? Is that an incorrect statement? Yes. And, you know, people have agendas and uh, nobody calls them out. And as Amy said before, all the wrong people were speaking early in the pandemic. You guys know to come here and get good information, but not everybody does. Well, the major problem was that certain individual high up in the government came out and said children are not susceptible. Yeah, that was a big problem. So then the question is, is, well, if my child is not susceptible, why am I vaccinating? So... Huge mistake, not explained properly. 
and not apologetic for making the huge mistake and just coming out and saying, uh, I'm not sure why I said that because I was wrong and maybe the Martians had my brain or something or it wasn't connected to my mouth at that time. I'm not sure. I'm not sure because I'm not sure how one would have ever concluded that, but that's what they did. So consequently, well, if you don't if you don't correct yourself in an apologetic, non condescending, non antagonistic, non belittling, disparaging way, then of course somebody like I don't know who this person is. I don't even know who the person he replaced is, really. But they're going to come out and say that there's no benefit for a vaccine because my child was not susceptible to disease. So why should I give? Why should I give the vaccine? Maybe their internet was broken at that point in time. I thought he said it at a podium with a microphone. I'm just I'm just riffing on what something you said. I know. I know what you're riffing on, but I'm not clear. I'm not clear. Or... I'm not clear how that I'm not clear how that that would work. Maybe as I said, their brain and their mouth were not connected that day. I'm not sure. But it was not a smart thing to say. When was the last case of hantavirus in the US 2019? Only because that's the last reporting year. They probably have since then, but they haven't yet reported it. We use antivirals in influenza with a high versus low risk. Yes, we did say that. But um, the, the vaccines for influenza are not very good, and a lot of people are not vaccinated, which adds to the equation, right? Here we yes. have good vaccines. Yes, but we still have a significant portion of the population who's not vaccinated. Yeah. No, I think if you're not vaccinated, you should take Paxlovid for sure. Yeah. Um, do you still think five years on the pandemic, Amy? Worldwide, yes. Hmm. In this country, maybe four. Many people are saying they're donating, Amy, so. That's very nice. Thank you all we'll for we'll, all of your help. We'll do this for a couple of weeks and uh, hope we can make a dent for you, okay? Yes. All right. It's 922. So eight more minutes and then I have to go wash my Eliza. Okay. I don't like that expression. Stay in your lane. It's what the NRA told docs who counseled on guns. Well, okay. You can not like it because of the NRA, but uh, Daniel uses it and it's fine. Everyone can like or dislike. Is okay, this year's... We... Well, sorry. Go ahead, Amy. Go ahead. No, it's fine. Are you okay with stay in your lane? Uh, it's not my favorite, but it has a point to it. Um, so, like, there were, like, you guys have all advocated that it's okay for people, for en other fields to enter for, for this. And it gives new ideas and I was never a big supporter of people just entering because they thought that they could get a lot of money. Yeah. It's very sad that this happens, but I um, think the principle, Patricia, that people who are not in the field are making silly statements like the one we just discussed about sterilizing vaccines. That's what we're trying to say. Don't talk about what you don't know about. So if you have a better phrase for it, let me know, and I'll start saying it in front of Daniel. Well, yeah, I think that there's... I don't think wheelhouse, stay in your wheelhouse is right either. Um, I don't know what a wheelhouse really means, but... Um, yes. It's more than just staying. It's more than just staying in where you're trained. It's really, because uh, you know, I'm not really a trained immunologist, but I can figure things out. 
I'm actually not a, I've actually never taken an immunology course, but I can figure things out. And you can look at the biology and you can figure it out. So I think it has more to do with like the lack of understanding and the superficiality and people saying things that are, cause they want the attention. They're attention seekers, right? And like P.T. Barnum said, you know, there's no such thing as bad publicity. And as I told somebody last week, it, when something's new, you can write, you can publish any piece of shit you want. And and the problem is once it's published, then even if it's wrong, it's stuck. And well, yeah, people... I mean, we're still talking about integration of either the mRNA or of the vaccine or from the genome or something or other because of the idiot at, at MIT, right? Who should never have pu published that, forced that paper to be published, right? And then, and then what happened was somebody tweeted it and then it got all this uproar, right? Like a certain person who used to be at Columbia was like, oh, this could be possible. <laughs> Right. And then he yep. tweeted it and, you know, him being a retrovirologist, it was like, oh, well, if this retrovirologist thinks it's possible, then most likely it is possible. Right. And it came from a cancer guy. Right. Isn't the guy mm. at MIT a cancer guy? Yeah. Development cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about Yanish, right? Yeah. Yeah. That was a travesty. Yeah, exactly. And so look at what it started, right? Because now we're still talking about it just, I mean, it has a different detail of it being an H2H7 cells, but it's the same thing over yep. and over yep. and over again, right? Yep. Is this year's avian influenza normal? I think so. I've been following the CDC reports and there's always some increase, but it doesn't seem to be anything unusual now. Sam Harris recently released the podcast Recipes for Future Plagues discussing deep VZN and gain-of-function research. Probably Sam doesn't really understand either. Who is Sam? Don't know. Don't care. Well, so here's my, here's my problem. Google how to make a bomb in mom's kitchen and how many recipes do you get? Sam Harris is a neuroscientist, philosopher, New York Times author, and blah blah blah. So oh, he so he's a Lex Friedman person. He doesn't oh, know anything about viruses. No, but so here's my problem. If I Google how to make a bomb in your kitchen, there's like fifteen hundred entries, if not more. Has anyone successfully made a bomb in their kitchen? Yeah, people have. Sure. No, they haven't actually. Well, didn't the Unabomber make bombs in his kitchen? No. Remember him? I do remember him, and he was not, no. So, and the person who last tried to make a bomb put it in his pants and tried to blow up his penis, which didn't work out well. He just third degree burned his entire groin. Right. So, Lori, the thing is so, that, go ahead. I'm to sorry. make a virus yeah. in your garage... If I have trouble doing it in my lab and yeah. nobody can really successfully make a bomb, which is less microscopic, it's more macroscopic. I'm not that worried that somebody is going to make a, a plague in their kitchen or garage anytime soon. And gain of function research is absolutely important research. It's totally important, and, and you just hear the bad side from people like Sam, who doesn't understand it. We need to sequence these genomes, and so there's nothing wrong with any of that, and nothing bad will ever come of it. Nothing bad has ever come of it. It's just Well, sequencing doesn't tell you anything, right? So I can sequence all the enteroviruses I want. Is that going to tell me where the receptor binds? No, not at all. But okay. You could model it. You could model it, couldn't you, Amy? No, you really can't. Somebody would. So I can model. So I modeled. So Rossman modeled sixty-eight 
off of Rhino 14. Mm -hmm. And I'm not 100% convinced that the receptor binds the canyon. Well, Could very easily shows... bind at the two-fold or three-fold axis of symmetry. Well, you got to you got to be careful with structure determinations. Yeah, the way you massage the data can determine the outcome, right? Right. So, well, even the way you do the structure and the binding, but that's irrelevant. So, that's what I'm saying is you can't. Is so you said you can model it, and I'm saying it's not that easy to model. I, you know. All right. Um, when you say we have vaccines that work, can you explain the up-to-date data on how they work for young children? Well, as Amy said, there are conflicting data, so we really need to wait until that's sorted out, right, Amy? Yeah, for I sure. Don't think we, I don't think we have the bottom line yet, and I think the headlines are un, unwarranted at this point. We the are 98... Sure we are 98% seropositive in the UK, but blah, 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 blah shows cases are rising, a new symptomatic cases we transmit. No, some of you transmit, not all of you, Nick. Don't make blanket statements from such data, okay? Never said right. that we didn't transmit. I just said you transmit less and for a shorter time, and that makes a big difference. Are you going, Amy? Yeah, it's time for me to go. I have to wash my Eliza. Ooh. All right, you want to see my picture one last time? My you beautiful bet. picture. Look, for anybody who missed my beautiful painting by Jen and Animal Party. See? Look. Oh, wait. It's not let, centered. Let, let me pull myself out of here. There you go. Now you got the whole Look screen at it. to yourself. Look at it. Isn't it beautiful? It's gorgeous. It's very Amy nice. D68. Yeah. It's very cool. Can't wait to hang it. All right. You can come back. Are you, do you know how to bring yourself back? I'm back, yeah. All right. But I'm on I'm the leaving. wrong side, but that's okay because you're leaving. Thank Doesn't you, Amy. Matter. I'm leaving. All right, Thank bye. Bye-bye. See you tomorrow. Oh, that's it. Swap cameras. There you go. Okay. Let's see what we have here. Michael, thank you for your contribution for the incubator. Where's Amy going? Well, she wants to have a more permanent position then at Columbia. And so she's looking at jobs and she has a good iron in the fire, but I don't want to jinx her. So we'll see. In a couple of weeks, we may know. We'll make an announcement. But she would leave New York. Yeah. And Terje makes the good point of Sarah Positive for what, which I didn't want to get into. But yes, there are still many who can and will be infected. Does it matter? No, they're protected. You're absolutely right. And even if they are transmitting to a certain extent, it doesn't matter. You're absolutely right. Oh, oh, I wanted to know if you folks liked the interview with David Molesky. Um, I thought that was fun. And I should do more artist interviews at the incubator and get more art at the incubator. Yeah, that would be fun. And thanks for donating to, to Amy's Research Fund. It would be very much appreciated. Um, can someone please explain the terms variant versus mutation? I'm sorry, you've been listening for a few years and you still don't get it? Well, a variant is any virus that differs from another one. So you say SARS-CoV-2, if they isolated some from me and some from you, and they did their genome sequence and they found some changes, those would be two variants of SARS-CoV-2. A variant simply means an isolate, because isolates are typically differing in at least one base. So that is what makes a variant. If it were exactly the same genome, which is highly unlikely from two different people, they would be the same virus. They would not be variants. Now, variants, what make them variants are mutations in the genome, the genome, the 30,000 base genome of SARS-CoV-2. Any one of those 30,000 bases can change. If one changes, then in your, in your virus versus mine, that makes it a variant. Okay? I hope that explains it. Indeed, telling someone to calm down has the reverse effect. I don't know if, did I say that? I usually don't say calm down. I usually say, let me finish. <laughs> because people get excited to explain to you what they're saying, right? And 
I want to finish. But anyway, you're right, Whiskers. I think that's a great that's a great point. Mask mandates will be over, but there should be a caution advised voluntarily to keep wearing them when a person feels in danger. Well, certainly everyone could wear them. But yes, if there are high infection rates over 10, 20 per 100,000 in an area, then you might want to wear it if you feel it threatened. But I personally believe the data on the vaccines tell me that I'm really well protected, 80, 90 percent protected against severe disease. So I'm going to get infected probably every year. I'm going to get sniffles and I'm going to get boosted by that infection. So I don't have to worry. I never need another boost. That's how I see it happening. And so again, this is, this is many people are asking about the Thuija study. So line one are cells that make reverse transcriptase at high levels. You put RNA, it gets reverse transcribed. There is zero interest in that because you have, your cells are full of mRNA and that happens to those mRNAs all the time and there's no consequence. So there's zero consequence. This is an artificial experiment that has no meaning whatsoever and it shouldn't have even been done. Because first of all, they're liver cells in the lab. Who cares? Even if they were respiratory cells, I wouldn't care because it's cells in the laboratory. You show me that one person who got an mRNA vaccine has an integration of that in its genome and it did a, uh, 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 it caused some harm, then I'll be worried. But there's no, that's not happening. It's just not happening. And it's not happening in 40 years either. Why? Because our cells have mRNA in far greater levels than what's injected into you. Okay. How does serotypes relate to molecular variations? Well, of course, you, you can't have a serotype without molecular, without mutation, because what makes a different serotype are changes in the proteins of the virus, and those are caused by, by mutations in the genome, right? And so, you know, we don't know what exactly, what mutations exactly would cause a new serotype, but they have to happen for sure. So Patricia thinks li lifting mask mandates is premature. So I don't think so. And we've been saying this now for quite a few weeks um, because I think for most people, the vaccines are, are quite effective, people who are able to take them and who have taken them. And But as you know, Patricia, there is a certain political motivation to this as well. I don't agree with that for being the motivation, but I do think it's the right move based on the data. I read the polio IPV does not protect against infection, but OPV vaccine does. So that's not quite correct. Uh, it does no no vaccine except perhaps HPV is is preventing infection. For OPV, so for IPV, right? There's no antibodies in the gut, which is where you you ingest the virus. It goes into your intestine, begins to reproduce, gets into the blood, and there it will encounter antibodies that stop it. For OPV, you have antibodies in the gut, but virus will still get in and begin to reproduce. However, when you first get OPV, you, you, that virus reproduces in your gut and you shed it, and that circulates among the population. So it doesn't absolutely block infection, but it, it knocks it down quite a bit, yes, for sure. And in IPV, you're absolutely right, does not. Is there a better way of saying natural immunity? Yeah, I think it's infection-induced immunity, but the press doesn't like that. Too many words, too complicated. They always back into that excuse. Too many words, too complicated. People are not going to understand. Well, you know what? If you started teaching people what it all means, maybe they would get it, but the press doesn't want to do that. Masks are such as low cost, easy protection, why not do it? Well, exactly, you can wear masks forever if you would like, every day, why not? No one is telling you not to, I choose not to, um, except perhaps in the winter, maybe in some future winter, I'll wear masks to see if my common colds or flus are less so, but I, I barely get those anyway, so I'm not sure that would, I'm not sure that would matter.
survivor's immunity. I'm not sure I like that. Infection-induced immunity. I know you got the extra. You got the extra word in there, and that's what we don't like. Yeah, there we go. Infection-induced immunity versus vaccine-induced. Yeah, Terje gets it. He, he he agrees with me. Well, he said it before I said it, but I didn't see his comment. So um, Amy's gone, but here I mostly agree with Amy's definition, but why must it be defined as the induction of severe disease? Wouldn't a whole other strain as well as serotype cause severe disease? Well, in the case of polio, where the early serotypes were defined, it was polio, which is severe disease. And so if it's moderate disease, then it's hard to say that is polio, right, as opposed to some other virus. Maybe that's part of the problem. Is it possible that microdosing happens accidentally over time where exposure to small amounts of infectious virus creates some memory and protection but does not lead to full infection? So I don't think, I think that's fine for boosting. But for your first exposure to a virus, you need to have an infection to get substantial immunity. You need to have a good amount of antigen to go into those lymph nodes and cause the antibodies to mature and get more higher affinity. So I don't think a little bit of virus popping in there is enough that first time. But the boost, perhaps, it will help to boost it after that, yeah. February 2020, China said symptoms of COVID were only dry cough, fever, and difficulty breathing. Many of us also had other symptoms but were denied testing. Did China have a different variant with only three symptoms? No, they didn't. We know that because their genome sequence is you know, pretty similar to what's circulated later. But that's what they figured out earlier. Um, but they certainly learned later that there were more symptoms after that. And I think this is the learning process. We had to start observing and say, oh, this is not just dry cough, fever, and difficulty breathing. They knew there were other symptoms as well, such as, you know, loss of smell, loss of taste, um, neurological symptoms, gastrointestinal symptoms, etc. So, um, Michael, a human papillomavirus vaccine is the only vaccine that prevents infection. And the idea there is that very high levels of antibodies are maintained in the cervical mucosa, which prevents infection. Now, why that particular vaccine does that, I'm not aware, and I'm not sure it's understood why it does, because if we did understand, we could perhaps transfer that property to other vaccines, but we don't know why. Any interest in the recent wild polio case? Yes, there was a case of wild polio in um, Malawi, which was uh, in an unimmunized child, and the virus came from you know, Pakistan or Afghanistan. The two countries were type 1 polio. Wild polio is still circulating. And this is unfortunate because it's preventable, but they let the vaccination levels drop, and you can't do that because as long as there's type 1 wild polio circulating somewhere in the world, you are at risk. The risk is low, but you're still at risk. And so... We need to get those countries vaccinated for sure. Michael, thank you for your contribution, and I just answered your question. That's the latest on vaccines for kids under five. The, the data are, are still being evaluated. They were going to be released, but they decided to hold it back for further evaluation. So now... You know, we're not talking till next month, I think, of, of having them released. Thanks for everyone who uh, is donating to Amy's research. I really appreciate it. I want to help her out. Do you feel like a booster is important for a 29-year-old 
double vax with Pfizer about 11 months ago. Paul Offit and a few others seem against it. Yeah, now Paul Offit doesn't think their data support the need for a boost. I didn't initially either. I agreed with Paul for many months. But what changed my mind, and it's not perfect data, is that the so the first two doses are given too close together, three, four weeks apart. That's too close to allow the antibody response to properly mature. And the third boost, boost fixes that. However, I'm not sure how, how important antibodies are. And it's not clear to me that even without the boost, you would have any decrease in protection against severe disease. So, you know, the data say that the antibody response gets better with a boost. So I would say I went with that and I was really a holdout. But I agree, pull off it doesn't. Doesn't either. Hi, guys. Love the colors. If you were 50 pounds overweight, over 50, would either of you go to an indoor standing room gig? Vaccination required, no masks, under 12 years. Uh, and negative test and mask required. No, I wouldn't. But I wouldn't go to the gig anyway. So <laughs> it's not a fair question. It's not a fair answer. Um, I don't know. Are you triple vaccinated? I think it would be fine. And then if you start to sniffle, you get tested, you're positive, you get an antiviral. I think it's fine. Thank you, Lisa, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Shouldn't the criteria for masking be based on a risk comparison to ordinary endemic viruses that we don't require masks for? Yeah, well, this is now an endemic virus, but I'm not sure how ordinary it is. People would claim it's not because it's killed so many people, but it's on its way to becoming an ordinary virus. And my position is that with the vaccines, you are protected against severe disease. Not everyone, I understand, immunocompromised under five years old, not protected yet. But we do have alternatives for them. And so we can, so you can make your choice in the winter when this is going to circulate, you could wear a mask, but I don't think everyone needs to. We don't all wear masks in the winter. Some countries do, and that's fine. But it's a ch I think that needs to be a choice. And I think the public health aspect here is that we develop the vaccines and they work. And so that's the path forward. And we also have antivirals in case the vaccines are not working in you. And yes, it's true that immunocompromised and over 75 can still get severely ill. In fact, Daniel says that most, most of the people who get severely ill that he sees are unvaccinated, but there are a few who are vaccinated and they're typically older and have comorbidities pretty much regularly. So yes, but at what point do you move forward? This is how it is. It's not going to get better, at least not with these vaccines. This is what we have to live with. Now, maybe in five years we have a vaccine that protects against all variants. It's not going to be sterilizing, but let's say it protects 90% against disease by all variants. But it's never going to do that because people are different. They're older and they're immunocompromised, and that's what makes the vaccines not work. So this is what we have. It's not changing. You have to live with what we have, vaccines and antivirals and monoclonals, and that's underlying my approach. Is it fair to say that Omicron induces a more efficient mucosal immunity than other variants since it infects better the upper respiratory tract? I'm not convinced about those data. I think they're, they're really crappy, frankly, and they don't hold up to snuff. They're poorly done. And uh, so I'm, and I'm, even if they were correct, I'm not sure that would necessarily on its own lead to greater IgA in the upper tract. That's something we'd have to sort out. We don't know yet. But it's a good question. Part of ad 26 j and RSV trial, would you think Moderna mRNA would be better? Not necessarily. I mean, you can't extrapolate from the COVID success, right? I mean, uh, ad 26 is nothing to sneeze at. Maybe not as good as the mRNA vaccines, but I'm not sure that it extrapolates to every virus. So... I think that being in the trial is great. Yep. How 
How hard is it to do experiments involving FC receptor function vis-a-vis SARS-CoV-2? I'm very interested about non-neutralizing antibodies. Yes, they're very interesting, and nobody pays any attention to them, right? Everything's a neutralization assay because it's really easy to do. How hard is it to do? Well, you can, it's not terribly hard. People have done it for other viruses. Look up Michael Diamond's paper. He has a recent paper on myarovirus where he shows that non-neutralizing antibodies are important, and he can do that in mice where you take out certain cell populations that have FC receptors. And so it's it can be done. It's not impossible and should be done. I'm curious if you have thoughts on recent findings that T cells might age, become less effective. Yeah, they do, of course. As you age, they um, you have trouble make, making new T cells as you get older. You still have memory T cells, although that may be different in, in different people and with different viruses, for example. Uh, but um, And I think that the key is the longevity of the memory, right? And so that can vary based on the person in the virus, for sure. Why is everyone acting like COVID is gone? Because they want it to be gone. They want their lives back, okay? And it's not gone. It will never be gone, Gwen. It will never be gone. It's always going to be here. It will always pose a threat to certain people. And as I have just said, we've done pretty much the best that we can do in terms of vaccines, maybe more antivirals. <laughs> Any updates on pan-coronavirus vaccines or drugs? Nope. And still in the works. It's going to take some time. You know, it is going to take some time to do this. Queen Elizabeth barely got sick. Maybe the vaccines work. Well, she probably got other things as well, right? She got antivirals or monoclonals. I'm not sure, but I bet she did. Uh, Nova Vax. Yes, we don't know what's going on, but hopefully soon, right? What if the RNA is integrated so it disrupts a tumor suppressor gene? Then is it consequential? Okay, Eric. No, but that's not happening. You have hundreds of thousands of mRNAs in every cell in your body. Are you getting disruption of tumor suppressor genes? No. So why should a much smaller amount of mRNA do that? It makes no sense. Think about it. And, you know, many people have gotten this mRNA vaccine, millions and millions of people. Now, if you're telling me we'll find out in 40 years, well, that's just a non sequitur. Right. We, we, we need this now and it works and it's safe. And there's no evidence from cells or animals that it, it integrates any more than our cellular mRNAs. That's my point. There are many mRNAs in our cells and we don't have this issue. So this would be a very, very rare event. Now, of course, this kind of disruption did happen with early gene therapy. But there you're putting in a virus that integrates on purpose. And so that caused the problem. Very high efficiency integration. What's your opinion on unmasking for air travel? So air travel is another ball of wax because not everybody's vaccinated. And if I go on a plane, look, I, as I've said a billion times, I feel that the data say that I am protected. It's not 100%. I could get sick. So when there are people who are um, on the plane who worry about that, wear a mask. I probably wouldn't wear one because I, I have confidence in the data on the vaccines. But I'm um, not sure they're about to raise the masking on all airlines, right? Vanity Nutrition would know. But what we try and do here is give you the science information that uh, you can't get from the press in some detail. Of course, we also do podcasts where we get into it in uh in a, in a deeper way. But here you can come and ask us questions, and we're here every week. So that's what we're trying to do. 
Now we're getting into the bagels and coffee. <laughs> bagels, bagels. She's got depressed when Amy said we are not past this. I do hope she's wrong, but she knows what she's talking about. She's probably right. So what is it? We are in March, so we'll just count it and see what happens. Yep, because we'll be all here for the next year, right? Why do macrophages only have MHC2? Well, that's so they can present antigens to T cells. That's what you need for T cell receptor presentation. Well, other cells have uh, uh, um, dendritic cells and macrophages have MHC2. And well, the others have MHC1, which present antigen to CD8 T cells. If yogurt companies sometimes discover useful antibiotics and monetize the IP, then what about virus research outside of the lab? Uh, I, I, it's fun, you know, CRISPRs were discovered, partially discovered in yo the activity or the function of CRISPR were discovered in a yogurt company, right? But I'm not sure what you're asking about virus research outside of the lab. Uh, I don't know what you mean. Bagels should never be toasted. Uh, the cardiologist says he wants to have a national televised debate with Dr. Oz. What a waste of time. Yeah, who would listen? Both of these, I don't know what they're going to talk about. If they want to talk about heart surgery, fine, because they both work on the heart, right? But if they're going to talk about viruses, I think that's a travesty. Why would they have a debate? Ridiculous. So this whole idea that sequencing of viral genome is a problem means nothing. It, 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 why, why do you think it's a problem? If I am a virologist of 40 years and I say it's not a problem, why don't you accept that? Because I'm telling you, you can't do anything with the sequence. Nature takes viruses and they mutate in their hosts. And then by random chance, one of them can infect a human. And given the perfect storm, you have a pandemic. There's no one that any human could do to duplicate that. I'm sorry. I've been trying to engineer viruses for 40 years. It was the one of the first people to do engineered gain, gain of function. And I tell you, there is nothing wrong that comes of it, of having especially genome sequences in a publicly available database. There's nothing that anyone could do with that. Hello, Ian. Thank you for the Blue Eddy. I'm going to unbox it. Let's see, when will I be there? I'll be on Friday. I'll unbox it, take a picture, and send it to you. It's really heavy. It's 70 pounds. I have to figure out how to get it to its next place. <laughs> what do you think about administering antivirals immediately at the testing station to people who test positive? If, if you, I mean, that would be ideal in terms of timing, right? Because the earlier you get an antiviral for these rapidly multiplying viruses, you know, they're over in 14 days, the better. Okay, so that is makes sense, but I don't think everyone needs to take this antiviral. All right, so I suppose if you go get, let's say you're, you're perfectly healthy, but your company requires you to be tested, right? And you get a positive. What are you, you going to take an antiviral? I don't believe you give antivirals to healthy people and, and unless you're symptomatic no but it it's not going to be too late the first uh, the onset of symptoms you're still at the peak of virus multiplication so you can make an impact do you think it's likely a fourth vaccine will be recommended for some people in the future that depends on the country if you're talking about the u.s gosh i hope not this is just so unneeded. The third dose was it that corrected all the problems. Fourth dose is not needed. Um, in some countries it might. I don't think a fourth dose is needed. Now, maybe a study will show that in people with comorbidity, the fourth dose, dose does the trick, right? 
or in people over 90, a fourth dose does the trick. Hey, if I see those data, then yeah, but we don't have them right now. So I'm hoping not, Tom, in the U.S. anyway. How do N antibodies work if N is inside the envelope? What do you mean by work, okay? FC, <laughs> FC receptor. This is good, good handle. As far as we know, N antibodies do not have any impact on infection, as far as we know. If you did a neutralization assay where you mix antibodies with virus and try and infect cells, they wouldn't do anything because, as you say, the N protein is inside the envelope and the antibody could not access it. So N antibodies are certainly made during infection, as you know, but they have, as far as we know, no impact on infection. Leonardi is a nut who claims SARS-CoV-2 is an extinction event. He's also as qualified as an immunologist as your plumber. Okay. <laughs> hmm. I heard that a serotype is a variation within a species of bacteria or virus or among immune cells of different individuals. Well, that's not quite right. Amy gave her de definition earlier. Uh, her definition is that you get infected with one virus and then you're, you get infected with a related one. And if you're protected from, from disease, it's the same serotype. But if you're not, it's a different serotype. But it would have to be the same disease. And you would have to show that, right? And it's hard because polio, paralytic diseases, can be caused by more than one virus. So you'd have to have a diagnostic to prove that. That's her definition. But, and she would not like to hear this. Other people do not use that definition. They say, we do a neutralization assay in cell culture to define serotype. And I, I, that's not the original way it was done, and she's right about that. Which came first, the virus or the cell? So in the early days of Earth, you know, many billions of years ago, in the organic soup, pre-cellular, there were nucleic acids that could self-replicate. These evolved. And there were RNA molecules. No cells yet. No life. Those gave rise to cells. And then they went into cells and captured capsids by capturing capsid genes in the cell, and then they became viruses. So uh, the cell came first, but these self-replicating replicons were there before cells, which are the ancestors of viruses. But they're not, you know, I asked Eugene Kunit about this. Were they viruses? And he said, no, we should define a virus as having a capsid or some kind of covering. And so they're not viruses. Reportedly, children of polio were forced to flee Ukraine as refugees. Well, I don't know why there would be polio there, right? Because they were vaccinated. I don't know any reports of polio, right? We, we get pretty good reports globally. Um, but it's, I think the risk is low because if most people are vaccinated, and that will protect you from getting polio. It's quite clear, right? Uh, could such a rapid rise of multiple variants be partly because all the easy fitness improving mutations were found fast and more variants might take longer? I, I'm not sure that that's it. So I think it's just a matter of this is a this is a new virus that we've never seen before. We had no concept of how much variation it could undergo. And once it got into many, many millions of people with some immune pressure, then we saw the variants arise. And I think most of the variants are selected by immunity. Um, I, f I see very little evidence that there are other selective pressures for their emergence. So the idea that we've exhausted the variability, no, I don't think that's correct. I don't see any reason to think that. I mean, viruses ex have existed for many, many hundreds of thousands of years, and they show no evidence of stopping variation, as far as I can tell. So I think that's, um, uh, what is, what's the term? Uh, wishful thinking, right? Uh, 
Do you feel that uh, 5 to 11 will need a third boost? So if they get the first two within three to four weeks, yes, because that's bad. We shouldn't be doing three to four weeks. Would the antiviral protect you for long COVID? Great question. And we don't know, right? We have no idea. And it may be that with an abbreviated replication course, which the antiviral would do, right? It brings down virus levels and really decreases all the cells in which the virus and is re reproducing in. Maybe that would help avoid long COVID because maybe long COVID is in part some of the antibodies against the virus is, are reacting with cell tissue, with our tissues, and that's part of the problem. But I don't know. I think it's a good thought, and we won't know until we get some data. Yeah, great question. Very good question. A family member immunocompromised will getting fourth dose soon. Would you suggest now five months or wait a little longer? I think five to six months is fine. I think that's, that's a really good timing. Test and treat is problematic, not least because the antivirals need to be given at the right interval post-infection. I think it hasn't really been thought out. Well, it's hard to – what are you going to do? I mean, I think the idea that you get tested, you're positive, you get tre treated right there, that's probably the best you can do. There's no delay because if you wait, then you're getting further and further away from the, the when the infection occurred, right? And, and that's a problem because virus titers start to decline and the antiviral will not have an effect. Um, but I don't, I, I just don't understand why we're doing this. Why over 80 for antiviral? Well, I, over 80, you were at risk for a severe disease. As I said, Daniel's severe patients who, who get very sick and they're vaccinated are the ones over 80 or with comorbidities. And so that's why you would give them either monoclonals or an antiviral at the first. So if they got tested and they were positive, you would do it just to be careful because they're a high risk group. And yes, the, the antiviral is expensive, right? But uh, it shouldn't matter, right? You sh no one should have to pay for it. What did we learn from... Oh, all right. So this one popped up. What do you think China's zero COVID policy because of the, is because of the quality of their vaccine? No, I just think they're able to have this kind of policy because they exert great control over their population, right? So um, I don't think it has anything to do with the quality of the vaccine. What did we learn that will improve our response? <laughs> oh, boy. I always argue that this, this could have been prevented if we'd had some antivirals, some coronavirus antivirals. But of course, no one wanted to develop them because there wasn't anything to sell them to, there were, right? There was no market. So maybe have we learned that that was a bad policy, that we need to be, be developing antivirals, not just for this one, but for others? We could make broadly acting corona antivirals and vaccines. And I think that that would be f good enough. I think coronaviruses and influenza viruses are the two viruses that are really going to cause future pandemics. I don't see anything else, even though there are lots of viruses out there. I don't see anything else that I know of as a pandemic threat. Now, of course, that's the point, right? That I don't know what's out there. So there could be other pandemic threats, but you can't work on what you don't know about, right? I have to say that I'm at Columbia and everyone has to wear masks and the students would like to not. They're like, they ask me, why do we have to do this? We're vaccinated. There's, you know, if there's someone who's immunocompromised, it's known and they will be taken care of with antivirals or monoclonals. I think it's worth wearing if there's a need to do that. 
Thank you for Date Bio for your contribution. Yeah, so I think that, as Amy said, there are different interpretations of this, and I think uh, I don't think the dose is really the culprit here. I think other things must be uh, at hand, and we just don't know about it. Are there plans to offer a Molnu Purivir Paxlovid cocktail? So the way this works, and as you know, there are double and triple therapies for other virus infections. You license the individual monoclonals, and then the companies have to get together and agree to test them together because both companies have to, to agree to that. One company can't test the other companies together with theirs. So that hopefully this is going to be done. I don't know of any plans. I'm not privy to this. I'm just a virologist. But yes, then they would have to do a clinical trial, right? And you'd have to have enough cases somewhere to do that. And it's getting harder and harder to do, right? When my dad was in the hospital after having cancer surgery, his roommate tested positive for flu. They gave him Tamiflu. So in that case, that was a good idea, right? Because he's... he's Com his, his health is compromised. He's got a comorbidity. And so, yeah, treat him with Tamiflu. That's fine. That's exactly the right thing to do. Thank you, Susan, for your contribution to the incubator. Western Australia is finally opening its borders to COVID <laughs> with its 96.5% two-dose rate and a 64% booster rate and rising. What would you expect from this natural experiment. So you, you will get COVID, right? COVID will come in. There's still some uninfected people. Obviously, being vaccinated, fully vaccinated, does not stop infection. So people will get infected. Some of them may get sniffles. It does prevent severe disease. You're going to see the same thing that we've seen in every other part of the world where the vaccines are extensively used. <laughs> Has there ever been a virus that does not infect children but does infect adults? So there are two things here that we have to deal with, right? Um Does it, is it able to infect children, but it doesn't for other reasons that, you know, it may be it's sexually transmitted, right? So um, papillomavirus, sexually transmitted papillomavirus do not infect children unless they have sex. And the likelihood of that, someone under 12 is low. It's not zero, unfortunately, but so we don't see a lot of infections of those. So that's an example of that. But... I'm not aware of other viruses that wouldn't be able to infect children. Um, that can also infect adults. You know, all the all the viruses that we think about, right? Um, they can. I'm not aware of any of them that don't affect children. No, I could be wrong, but that's my off the top of the head <laughs> thought. Thank you, Margaret, for your contribution to the incubator. Be my teacher. Yeah, I am. I'm here. I'm here on the live stream. I'm doing the podcast. I do virology courses. I'm doing what I can to be your teacher. My pleasure. My my. It would be my honor to be everyone's teacher. Um, you know, no realizing that I can teach you virology, and I can tell you who could teach you other things, but virology is my thing. Thank you, Mystery Fine, for your contribution. Appreciate it. <laughs> Look at, all right, now we have a little puzzle here. Two people are in a closed, poorly ventilated room, one infected and shedding. The other is immune naive. They both wear N95s. Does the immune naive person get infected? 
well, they if they're fi- fit properly, right? That's one thing. Hopefully, so we're assuming they're fit properly, right? Because these things work best when they're fitted, um, and it, it's not a hundred percent, right? The protection is a certain percentage, you know, and it, it, you, that number, whether it's twenty percent or thirty percent. It's going to hit you at some point. It's a it's a matter of chance, right? So, the answer is maybe, most likely not, because you do get a good amount of protection from the N95. <laughs> if viruses' main goals are to reproduce, I haven't more viruses evolved that benefit their hosts rather than harming them. Well, I think. Most viruses on the planet benefit their hosts. We just don't know it. Just think about it. We have countless different viruses on the planet and and a few hundred that cause disease in people at, the, at most, maybe dozens and few hundreds that cause disease in animals, for example. The vast majority don't, and I think those are beneficial or neutral. So I, I just think we don't know. We haven't looked. It's not easy to look, but I think that's the situation. Uh, it's reported that over tw- about 12% of over 80-year-olds do not produce an immune response to a vaccine. Do you think in a pandemic like this, it should be routinely checked given the risk to the elderly? What do you want to check, that they that they uh, respond to the vaccine? Well, the problem is, for this virus, we don't know what response is good, is protective, T-cells or antibodies or both. For sure, T-cells protect you against severe disease. And it may be that the antibodies mainly function to prevent infection or at least to blunt it, right? So we currently only have easy ways to measure the antibodies, not the T-cells. The one T-cell assay is just not useful at all. So um, if we could do this, I I think it would be useful, yes. But we don't have the ability to to do it right now. Viral load, is viral load relevant in regards to how sick you become? No, it's relevant to whether you're going to get infected or not. So if you are if you acquire a small amount of virus, it never gets anywhere. It can't take a hold in you. And there's some threshold over which then it will take hold and that's it. But it does not affect the severity of disease. There's zero evidence for that, even though since the beginning of the pandemic, people have been claiming that there is, there is not. Multiple anecdotes do not make data. Mm-hmm. Love to go to dinner with Amy and Vincent and about my pleasure. Any, anytime if I come to your town, pleasure to go to dinner with you. Absolutely. Have a nice chat. If the half the children at a school are not vaccinated and mask mandate is dropped, should we still ask ours to wear masks? I would think so, because if they're not vaccinated, they're at risk, right? That's the problem, and I would have my kids do it, yeah. I mean, this is one of the situations where the pandemic's not over for, for them because they can't be vaccinated, right? Seen a lot of doctors on YouTube making videos with a lot of views about these mRNA integrate. Yeah, so these people have no understanding of the science behind this. They under, they don't understand that it's it's irrelevant for reasons that I've said, because they have no familiarity with the subject, and that's where it matters to have people that know what they're talking about. Uh. Is the mRNA integration thing just a dumb idea? Well, it does happen. I told you it happens with our mRNAs at a certain level. And why don't you go listen to my lecture on reverse transcription. There's a little bit in there, 10 minutes, where I talk about the fact that, yes, our mRNAs are reverse transcribed all the time, and sometimes they integrate, and sometimes they do disrupt genes. But it's so friggin' rare. And that's from a cell full of mRNAs every day of its life. 
not from an mRNA injected into you that lasts a couple of days. So it's just harebrained to think that that injection is going to do anything when m mostly we have no issues with our own mRNAs. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not a dumb idea. It happens. List, go watch my lecture. Please take you 10 minutes. Find the part about retro elements and listen to that. Ooh, can we have a pandemic TWIV award for the best scientists and turkey awards for the bad actors? Well, Amy wouldn't like either one. And I have to listen to Amy who would complain, but that's not a reason not to, to do it or not to do it. Um, uh, it would be interesting, but I don't like to give prizes. I think prizes are just, they screw up the field. You know, they make competition where it shouldn't be and... I don't like it at all. And and yes, I love these comments about political theater, gain of function, and people don't even know what gain of function is. Even Tony Fauci got it wrong, and he admitted he got it wrong. But here we got it right from day one. First off, Sam is on your side with vaccines and masking. He's just asking years from now, as technology increases, is someone who might be able to make an agent. Okay, so what are you going to do about that? 20, 30, 40, 100 years from now, someone's going to do something bad? Well, we're not going to stop them. And I am not in favor of limiting information dispersal just to stop a theoretically nefarious event in 100 years. No. And it's theoretical because there's no uh, proof that we can do it right now. Mm. What's the best response to give to people who repeat they won't get vaccinated because Robert Malone's claims are credible? Because his claims are not credible. Do you understand that Robert Malone is paid a lot of money to say that? He has alternative approaches that he makes a lot of money on. This is why he's saying that. He knows nothing. He knows nothing about what the mRNA vaccine does to you. He's using it to make money. He's laughing all the way to the bank. And if you're going to listen to Malone, you deserve what happens to you because he is just totally disingenuous. I, on the other hand, make no money from any of this. Your donations go to our nonprofit to support our activities. I have no agenda to tell you the truth except that it's what you need to hear. And so guys like Malone really piss me off because it's the worst of humanity in a way that he makes money off of lying to you and people buy it and all they have to do is come to me. I would sit down and go through every one of his points if you wanted me to. But other people have done that, so I don't have to. If a, sit, if a person feels slightly sick but better the same day <laughs> it was Omicron, how much time would they have to confirm with a rapid test? Uh, probably they would have a few days. It's not going to go away in one day for sure. I'm always d d worried about lifting mask mandates because it's too difficult to reinstate them. Well, we tried that once, right? The CDC back in May last year said no masks, and then, oops, they misinterpreted the Provincetown data, and they said masks. I agree with you, but uh, I think this is the time to lift them for sure. Okay, we're getting towards the end here. Seven minutes left. I do like the Beatles. I think they're fabulous songwriters, right? Um, many people say, ah, you know, it's old stuff, blah, blah, blah. Oh, by the way, I, I listened the other day to a YouTube video of a guy who owns a record store in North Carolina. Vinyl, he sells vinyl. And he has a video of the, the top 20 most demanded vinyl. And you know, there were a bunch of Beatle albums on there. Some Led Zeppelin. Uh, there was one Michael Jackson. Little Fleetwood Mac. You know what the number one most demanded album was? I, I guessed it. Dark Side of the Moon. Pink Floyd's a great band too. I love them. Yeah, I, I just, <laughs> their music is just so mesmerizing, right? If I got COVID by the time I was diagnosed and got an appointment with my doc, it would already be too late for an antiviral. Yeah. If it takes that much time, you're absolutely right. Yeah. 
I'm concerned about long COVID. Well, so the, the risk is never going to be zero. It's much lower with vaccination, right? Never going to be zero. That's what we have. That's the reality. This is what you get. We're not going to get much better for a long time, if ever. So you have to decide if you can live with it or not. That's how I look at it. I can live with it. But if you can't, wear a mask. Oh, 65% of Americans are fully vaccinated. That's absolutely right. It's not over 90%. No. I'm much more afraid of heart disease and cancer than I am of COVID. Uh, I'm not afraid of any of them, even though I have both in my family, because life is too short to worry about such things. I think you have to look positively and and be as distracted as I am by viruses or something else that turns you on. That's the way to do it. So you don't have time to think about it. Don't let yourself have times. Did I have any sports heroes growing up? Oh, man, I hate to tell you because I grew up in the 60s, right? And my, my, my family was a Yankees fan. So Roger Maris and Mickey Mantle were my heroes. But then I heard all about all the crap they did later, and I got depressed about that. Well, not depressed, but sad that they were my heroes because kids don't know what these guys do, right? Yeah, so my heroes now are scientists. Yeah, it's safe to get a shingles vaccine. Just space it out between... Uh, COVID vaccine. I think Daniel says 90 days or so. How do you think your interview with Molesky went? I think it was pretty good. Um, you know, I'm a much better interviewer of scientists, I think, because I ask science questions. And for, for art, it's like you could be you interviewing him, right? Because you would ask the same question. So I thought it was pretty good. And I thought he gave insight into his training and what led him to make that painting. And that's what I was trying to do. With supreme respect, I'm asking, since we're 80 to 90% protected, is that like playing Russian roulette? I don't like those odds. What are you going to do, Debs? What are you waiting for? Nothing better is coming along for a long time. The virus isn't going anywhere. This is the way it is. And in fact, you're playing Russian roulette with flu because the vaccines are far less effective. Flu can kill you every year, yet the vaccines are 60% at best effective, depending on how old you are. So I think you're playing roulette with influenza, frankly. And if you don't think that's an issue, then COVID's not an issue. Is HPV fully sterilizing in males? Good question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm going to look at that because I think that is a fabulous question. Absolutely. If SARS-CoV-3 comes out in a few decades, would antivirals like Paxlovid be ready? So what we have to do is figure out some broad-acting antivirals that would hit all coronaviruses. And I think we can do that because, you know, for this one, uh, this one is targeting the protease, of course, which is not as concerned, uh, which is not as conserved as um, the RNA polymerase. But I think a polymerase inhibitor, the polymerase is the most conserved protein among RNA viruses. Um, <clears throat> that would be the target, yeah. If adenovector can rarely cause uh, vaccine-induced thrombocytic th thrombocytopenia, would that mean adeno infections also cause TT? Yes, absolutely, because the interactions are there with the vector, yeah. Now, the only difference is that with the vaccinations, you're injecting the virus, and some of it's getting in the bloodstream. That's the idea. And I'm not sure that naturally happens in, in all adeno infections, right? There may be some that have a vi viremia, and then for those, you would see the increased clotting for sure. Is there a link for Amy's research? Yeah, it's right here. Um, oh, I have to... Uh, I'm going to turn back her thing. Here it is, givenow.columbia.edu, okay? 
I'm going to show in all scenes that. Now we can go back to my scene, and that will still show up. There you go. GiveNow.Columbia.edu. And when you go there, you, you scroll down and you search for enterovirus in the field, and her Entro D68 research will come up. Uh, what percentage of DNA is virus remnants? About um, 8%. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up now. It's late, and I don't need to keep uh, everybody here. Let me thank some people who have donated. Doreen, thank you so much. And thank you for also donating to Amy's research. I do want to help her because she's having a lot of trouble, and she's really good. So let's see if we can help her out for the next couple of weeks. Um, all right, so that does it for tonight, folks. I want to thank the moderators, Steph, Les, Tom, Vanity Nutrition. I didn't see Frank. Is Frank here? Nope. Well, if you are, thank you. Uh, I appreciate your helping out here. And thanks all of you for coming, 630 of you. That's a very respectable number. If you have a chance later, go to givenow.columbia.edu and help uh, Amy out. Meanwhile, uh, be safe, folks. Have a great week. Next week, we will be here on Thursday because Amy is out interviewing on Wednesday. Okay? So Thursday, whatever March that is. And then following that, we'll go back to uh, Wednesday nights. Thanks for coming, everyone. Thanks for the great questions. I know I didn't get to all of them, but um, we'll get to them next time. Come back. Michael, thank you for your contribution. Really appreciate it. Good night, everybody. Be safe.